What's up guys and gals and welcome back to the Nerd Castle. Today we're going to be checking out a little game called Away Team. Which as I understand it is sort of a sci-fi Star Trek meets text adventure. I used to love Star Trek text adventures back in the day. I had an Apple IIe when I was a kid. And like one of the only games that it had on it was like a Star Trek text adventure type game where you were, you were on like a grid. Basically it was like a grid like you would use in math class, like graph paper, and you would fly the Enterprise around and you could get into fights, and you could land on planets, and there was little text sections where you had to take people down to the planet and like do random stuff. It was a lot of fun, and I've always enjoyed titles like that. So without further ado, let's check out Away Team. Let's start this thing off. New game! And so we've got to pick our characters. So we've got candidates. Uh, we can have six per voyage. Alright, so we've got... Arik Pritz is a proficient mechanic fascinated by the inner workings of things. He prefers to spend time dismantling and rebuilding things. So he is a mechanic, he's observant, he's tough, but he's a loner. Okay. We've got Aislinn Fliff. She is a comedian, she is genial, she's lucky, and she's gluttonous. Okay. So I guess that she is in for a laugh. I don't exactly know what her designation would be in Starfleet. We've got Brecken Hoare. A usual cry-gen model, augmented not for combat, but for beauty and etiquette. So, counselor, polite, addicted, and distracted. So, I guess that she's got various addictions that we've got to worry about. We've got Cora Emmer. Cora is a bit hobbled by a crippling injury, but her aptitude with biology and chemistry qualified her for the journey. She's a scientist, she's observant, she's a team worker, and she's disabled. We've got Emery Borgia. Emery is young, but has accomplished a lot as both an athlete and a model. Okay, he's an athlete, he's genial, he's stubborn, and he's abstemious. I've never heard that word in my entire life. Abstemious. Okay. We've got Fallon Stabler. Uh, they are a Saijin, so once again, that's another android right there. She's a soldier, she's strong, she's violent, but she's xenophobic. Okay, we've got Callan Reeser. Keelan's crewmates wonder if he used to be politically influenced by a place on board. He's a politician who is confident, abstemious, and reckless. Okay, we've got Michael Rennick. Michael served in the military like most of his cybernetic genetic guide mothered brethren, but he was optimized not to take people apart, rather put them together. So he's a surgeon, he's, empathet or he's empathic, he's weak, and he's a kleptomaniac. We've got Osman Keenum, who's a farmer, who's strong, cautious, and competitive. And we've got Xavian Murs, who is a soldier who is stealthy, so we'll have Xavian Murs as our first candidate. I like that guy. Unlocks in easy mode. You can have two more. Uh, I like the mechanic, so we'll have the mechanic. We've got... I don't know what we would need a Canadian on board for, so I'm not going to take a comedian. However, I will take the counselor. I think that's a good idea. The person that knows how to talk is probably a good plan. I'll take a scientist with me. That seems like a good plan as well. Uh, we could probably go with another soldier. I don't think that would be like the worst idea. We don't have a surgeon on deck. Although this guy likes to steal. So we'll have a doctor on board, and then we'll probably bring... Is he violent as well? He's violent as well, so stubborn. I don't know who else we have. Um, I'll go with two soldiers. How about that? Fallon Stabler and Xavian Murs will be our two warriors. And we'll kind of have them at the front lines in case anything goes crazy. We'll put the game on medium, and let's see what this game has to offer. Let's play ourselves some away team. Click to advance the text. Enter... To skip, ZPVE deceleration cycle has been initiated. Wake inhibitors disabled, mission parameters loaded. By the mid-2050s, Earth was all but destroyed. Ravaged by war, climate change in fact, destroyed is the same thing as destroyed, just a little bit more drastic. Like, you don't want to get destroyed. If you get destroyed, that's all kinds of trouble. Unable to save the planet, scientists aided by artificial intelligence focused on perfecting intergalactic travel so humanity might live on. Starting in 2100, dozens of AI-run ships sailed into the void, the fate of their passengers unknown. Your ship, the smallest, fastest, and finest, is the last of these to leave Earth. You are the AI in charge of the ship, responsible not only for piloting and navigation, but also selecting crew for away teams based on their traits and flaws and advising them on missions. By now, Earth is a dead planet. Your crew is small, but they are the last known humans. Your choices will determine their fate. Move to the edge of the sector and activate light jump to visit new systems. Search each sector to find new planets, moons, and stations. Stock up on food and fuel. And do your best to find your crew a new home. Okay. So I suppose we will go down here then. Go ahead and fly our little ship on down. So that's Le Guin. It's a star class G. 
Summary, the atmosphere of the planet is unsuitable for human life, or indeed any form of life you can think of. In fact, it might very well be comparable with what Earth's atmosphere likely looks like at this point. Choked with toxic gases, beneath the dense dark cloud cover, however, there's definitely a solid surface, and a good chance of finding some kind of fuel for the ship. Even if sending the crew down to look around is a risk, it is a calculated one. Okay, I probably won't do that for right now, although fuel, actually, we do need some fuel. Hmm. Yeah, do it. We'll see what happens. Uh, so, on the away team... I'm going to send a warrior. I am going to send... Who was our who was our surgeon? Our medic will be him, and our engineer will be Cora, I guess? Do I have an engineer? I have a mechanic, and I have a scientist. Eh? Maybe the scientist can do it. Instructions. Click blue choices to advance the mission. Use controls to adjust missing text. Okay. Uh, not now. The atmosphere of this planet is completely unsuitable for human life, or indeed any form of life. We already did that. All the sensor readings are a bit strange, admittedly. Everything indicates that there's no possible way anything is alive down there. And yet some of the results are in line with what you'd expect to see if the life forms were present. There were Earth creatures who lived in some pretty inhospitable environments. Worms, bacteria, and the like thrived at the bottom of the ocean around geothermal events, for example. If there's anything down there, it's probably something like that, so long as the crew keeps their suits on. They should be fine. Surely the biggest challenge, however, will be finding a place to set the shuttle down safely. Once inside the atmosphere, it becomes clear that the planet is very geothermically active, or geothermally active, and much of the terrain is covered in molten rock that's hot enough to melt important pieces of the shuttle within a few minutes of setting down. You instruct the crew to try one of the poles as they do appear a bit cooler, more stable, and they adjust accordingly. Let's go to the South Pole. That sounds good. Rapidly descending into what appears to be a dormant volcanic caldera, Xavian Murs quickly locates a good landing site and sets the shuttle down. The ground does not immediately split open and, and swallow the shuttle in a violent eruption of liquid-hot magma, so the crew breathes a bit easier. For now. Initial sensor readings are inconclusive. There's either life signs all over the place or no life at all. What is more conclusive is that there are lots of black rocks flecked with gold everywhere. They don't appear to be obsidian or anything else associated with the volcanic processes, but are more along the lines of sticky tar balls or something of that nature. It'll be impossible to be sure until the crew gets out and picks one up, and on that note, Perhaps we should explore the surface to see what we might find up here, suggests Xavian. It'd be much safer than heading down into the unknown. Although based on the scarcity of resources up here, certainly it seems like going deeper might result in more stuff, to use a scientific term. Alright, so we can explain that. Yeah, I'd rather keep it safe and stay on the surface, I'll be honest with you. I'm not going to risk my crewman's life on risky stuff. The caldera is littered with black rocks of various sizes, ranging from tiny pebbles that skitter underfoot to boulders as large as the shuttle, all of them flecked with gold-colored material that sensors indicate is definitely not gold, a fact you reiterate to the crew several times. Hey man, when we see gold, we try to get it. I believe we gotta work on our pecuniary situation. As the crew makes their way among them, they discover that these stones also have varying degrees of hardness. The larger rocks are quite hard, though somewhat brittle, and the smaller ones are soft and pliable, even sticky, like tar balls. Cora Emmer suggested the crew might focus on collection of the smaller specimens, not only because they're easier to carry, but because the sensor readings would seem to indicate that there's slightly better potential for fuel sources. The crew does as suggested. Xavian Murs suggests that simply rolling some of the smaller boulders end over end back to the shuttle would be the most efficient way to go about gathering material. The crew looks around for a while but finds nothing of interest that they haven't already taken note of and or sampled in the same fashion. They're just about to turn back to the shovel when there's a or the shuttle when there's a strange. We're flying around in a space shovel. Don't worry about it. There's a strange sound nearby, a cross between a rumble and a squelch, as if someone had dropped a wet thousand kilogram sponge off a tall building. When they turn, they see a giant humanoid form has erupted from the ground, formed from tar-like sludge. It has no visible face, but a head and arms can clearly be made out. Whether it's mocking or mimicking the human form, or this is its natural shape, is unclear. What quickly becomes evident, however, is that it's intelligent because it begins to communicate with the crew. Um, are you hearing this? Says Xavian. You respond negatively. I think it's using some sort of telepathy, they continue. I can hear it in my head. I know it's ridiculous, but still. Uh, tell me what it's saying so I can assist. It's angry that we're here and wants to know what we think we're doing. Uh, tell it that we're looking for fuel. Xavian Murs relays the response, then listens intently for a few moments. You almost wonder if they're hallucinating. Telepathy isn't something you thought was possible, but then again, of course, if it's a hallucination and they're still managing to communicate, then maybe it doesn't matter if it's mental or not. A lot could be conveyed through chemical, subsonic transmissions, and so on. There are plenty of ways to reach a brain short of the paranormal. Uh, it'll says, it says we can have all the fuel we want, but we have to help it with something. 
Okay, what does it want? They go on to explain and translate for a while, explain that the creature wants another creature defeated. Apparently the entire planet is somehow under the control of two sentient beings, and despite how large it is, the planet's just not big enough for the both of them. Sure, I guess, says Xavier. It takes you a second to realize that they weren't addressing you, they were talking to the creature. No, wait, ask it to, uh... Before you can ask the crew to reply, the creature appears to dissolve into the ground once more, apparently assumes the crew will comply. So I sort of might imply consent, so now what do we do, Xavian says. Under normal circumstances, you imagine a decision like this wouldn't even be a consideration, but the crew hasn't really been under normal circumstances since the day you left Earth. Weird situations were bound to occur. I mean, we are in space right now. What kind of space opera would we be in if weird things didn't happen? That's most of the fun. I bet it actually inhabits the planet if we try to fly out of here. I bet in some way it is the planet. Like, I bet it's some kind of goo that fills in the planet, and there's another goo that fills in the planet. I guess we'll fight the other creature. Leaving the planet while exa without exhausting every other option for survival be short-sighted. If the crew needs to do something like this to ensure their own survival, then maybe it's fine. Morality isn't something you really consider to be a factor, especially not when it comes to alien beings of questionable sentience. Yeah, it's better they kill an alien creature and get some fuel than run out of fuel in interstellar space. Crew runs to the shuttle, but before they get the chance to board or prepare further, two creatures made of sludge and tar rise up in front of them, blocking the path. If there are any differences between the two, they're not apparent. Ah, uh, Houston, we got a problem, says Xavian. The one on the left seems to be upset that we agreed to fight it, and the one on the right is saying is upset we're not fighting the other one yet. They're bickering like children, except in our heads, not using words. He goes on to explain that the one on the left seems to be demanding that the crew prepare for a mental battle the likes of which they have never imagined. Uh, the crew suggests they might get them to fight each other instead, then sneak away in the confusion. Um, make them argue with each other. You tell the crew not to play the game anymore. If the creatures have a problem with each other, let them fight it out. The crew may die, but they may as well not die to play things as some sadistic alien tarball. Both creatures seem taken aback at this, and they dissolve into puddles. A moment later, they coalesce into a single giant creature twice as tall. Ah, uh, they're the same creature now, Xavian says. Indeed, it makes sense. You run some more scans, more focused now that you know what you're looking for, and the results confirm your suspicions. The entire planet is covered in the same black goop almost equally, though at various depths. There are not two or more creatures on the planet, only one. The planet is a creature, one symbiotic whole. You're not sure what the game was exactly, but you're sure it's over. You order the crew to board the shuttle, and as they do so, it deposits some of the material outside the door. A going-away gift? A booby prize? Who knows? The crew accepts it. Regardless, no sense leaving behind something that might prove useful. The crew is relieved when the shuttle finally reconnects to the ship, and they don't even bother to eat or clean up before collapsing into their bunks to decompress. You can only assume they're thinking the same thing you are, that this was some sort of test. Cool. Well, we got fuel. So there it is. We can actually, like, leave and go somewhere else. Let's maybe go to this little planet over here. We got some fuel out. So, ooh, a Terran planet. Kubrick. Even from multiple light seconds away, it's clear that this planet is one that has seen the touch of human hands, or at the very least, some other equally intelligent and technological advanced civilization. There are clear signs of habitation across the entire globe, although it's certainly no ecumenopolis. Even so, the amount of the planet that seems to indicate is urbanized in some fashion is significantly higher than what Earth was. Okay. Let's deploy some crew here. Uh, let's go ahead and take Xavian. I'd like to have a leader on board. Oh, they level up, too. They get better at their jobs. Uh, bring along... Where is the empath? Yeah, bring the polite counselor along. Bring her as an engineer. Bring the surgeon. We don't really need the mechanic or the... Bring another soldier, just in case. An extra soldier might be helpful. Let's just make sure we've got the muscle to back ourselves up in case something goes wrong. All right, if the, if the population of the equivalent to Earth at a peak, the planet looks like it'd be home between somewhere like one and two trillion inhabitants, but it's not. There are no signs of organic life. There's a radio signal, however. The precise nature of the message being broadcast is unclear, but it repeats the same pattern every 60 seconds and is clearly not random noise. As you enter into a stable orbit, you send the same thing back towards the planet, but there's no reply or change. Or reply or change. We'll need to send the crew down to investigate. The source of the transmission appears to be a large city, or what you presume to be one. It is not like a 21st century city on Earth, with grids of roads and rectangles full of square gray buildings, all steel and glass and asphalt. There's certainly metal and stone there, but the buildings are coppery spheres and domes, and they're scattered about a grassy plain without so much as a single visible road connecting any two of them. A child set of marbles tossed in the lawn and forgotten, each one nearly half sunk into the terrain. In the center of one of the densest patches of spheres is a flat circular area, more than large enough to fit the shuttle. 
Scans indicate that it's structurally sound and solid underneath, so it seems like a good place to land. Just because something sounds good doesn't mean it's a good place to land. Like, I can knock on my desk, but that doesn't mean I want to land a spaceship on it. It's a joke. Jesus. Uh, give order to land. The atmosphere is breathable, you inform the crew, but for now, let's not take any chances. Stay suited up, at least until we get a better idea of what we're dealing with. There are countless places to start looking around, but the crew quickly narrows it down to three candidates. The first of these, a large sphere, is also the source of the radio transmission. As far as you can tell, the other two are smaller off to each side. One is older, its surface covered in verdigris, and one on the right has a slight bluish tinge. From the outside, however, there's no way to ascertain their function or know what lies inside. Uh, let's go to the green sphere on the left. Although there's nothing resembling a door or window anywhere to be seen, getting inside of the sphere is a simple matter as portions of the exterior have degraded to the point of collapse. There are no signs of structural unsoundness, however, so there's no reason the crew can't take a look. The interior is composed of one large room approximately 20 meters across, broken up into segments by waist-high wall. These rooms are various sizes, and although some of them contain other wall segments and square structures inside, there's no obvious indication of their purpose. One of the walled-off areas directly opposite of where the crew entered has a depression on the floor, which appears to be something like a staircase. However, it goes down only four steps before ending in a blank wall. Scans indicate there's nothing below but solid ground. Okay, go to the bluish sphere. The blue sphere is completely sealed, not a single way to get inside anywhere along the circumference. Up close, however, the crew can tell that the surface is not entirely opaque. If they press their suit visors directly against it, they can see inside and make out a level of detail. The entire sphere is about 30 meters across, and as far as they can tell, the inside is one large space, although it appears to be broken up into segments by low walls. There's a clear division down one axis, splitting the sphere into two equal areas, and one within each area there are subsets of slightly lower walls that break up the space further. No indication of purpose. Well, I guess we'll just go to the large one. The large sphere in the immediate area is fairly impressive, even if the surface is fairly unremarkable in and of itself. It's usually 250 meters in diameter, approximately a third of which appears to be underground, anchoring it in place. The object is clearly built from some kind of metal, although the specific alloy is uncertain. Scans are inconclusive, almost as if something were interfering with them. Aside from a single rectangle facing the crew, the surface is entirely seamless. This looks like a door, but there's no obvious way to open it. Okay, look for a knob or lever. Cora, Gra or Cora Emmer inspects the area, as well as the ground, looking for a sort of mechanism. They try everything they can think of, but she can't find a way to open the door. It could rely on a radio signal, they suggest, but we have no way to test that theory that you can think of. Maybe we should just knock, says Breckenhar. Okay. She steps up to what you presume is the door and taps quietly on the surface. For a moment, nothing happens, and then the door soundlessly slides to one side, revealing the interior of the sphere. The interior of the large sphere is an immense, is immense, a cross between a giant outdoor theater and some sort of planetarium. The floor inside slopes down gently following the contour of the underground portion of the sphere in a series of shallow steps, or perhaps seats. Twenty or so meters at the very center at the bottom is a relatively flat but narrow column that extends out to the very top of the sphere. Now that the crew is in close proximity, it's clear that this is the source of the radio signal you detected earlier. Take a seat. The crew wanders around for a bit. But there's not much to see from bare stone and metal, so they find a place to sit about halfway down in the center. Almost immediately after being seated, the door to the sphere slides shut, leaving the crew in pitch blackness. But only momentarily, before they utter a word of concern, the interior of the sphere is illuminated by what appears to be projections from the sphere in the middle, which is spinning rapidly. The images are at first abstract blocks of color, but they very quickly coalesce into a single large image of the planet Earth hovering in space, with the moon visible off to the left and the sun off somewhere to the central pillar. The image appears static at first, but it gradually becomes clear that the image was taken from a spacecraft. Earth, moon, and sun grow smaller as they recede. The image abruptly cuts to black and is replaced by a ring of question marks around the circumference of the sphere. Dude, this is weird. Like, imagine that shit. You go through, like, light speed travel. You arrive on another planet. You walk into, like, the first building landing on an abandoned planet. And they've got some kind of, like, research facility. Or some kind of educational facility that's all about us. Like, holy shit, dude. The ring of question marks spin for a moment, then fade to black. The sphere becomes illuminated again, pinpricks of light, stars. These rapidly blur and distort, the projection clearly attempting to illustrate relativistic effects. You've seen this before, but the crew has never been awake for it. Based on what it's shown and where it abruptly leaves off, you'd estimate the ship would have to be traveling at at least 99.99% the speed of light, but the projection is not precise enough to know beyond that. You'd assume that this was filmed, or as a simulation, 
from one of your predecessor ships, however, which means... Are you an AI from Earth? In Xavian Merce's own voice, the words yes and AI are repeated. If this is true, you have to wonder why it hasn't contacted you yet. The blurry image in the interior of the sphere suddenly sharpens, and over the course of several minutes, it becomes clear that the crew is now seeing is the very system they are in now, and eventually the very planet that they are on. Are there any humans left? No, and human is the reply. You're about to, an to question this response when you begin to suspect that the video feed is giving you the answer. Instead of the view shifting as the ship enters orbit, the planet continues to grow larger and larger, eventually looming to fill half the sphere. The image begins to blur and redden before fading to white. And then there's blackness again. No human, says the AI. What a horrifying way to die, says Xavian. If the crew was awake, they'd have known that they were going to die for days, if not weeks. Slowly watching their inevitable doom approach, then either burning alive or being crushed in the impact. If it has any thoughts on the matter, the AI does not vocalize them, which is probably for the best. Hey, uh... Xavian says. You presume he's talking to you. Yes, you reply. Did you record what we saw here so we could watch it again? I did. Of course you can watch the entire things at 25 times the normal speed since there's no reason to drag it out and you watch it twice. Did any of it look strange to you, the crew asks? You reply, yes. At the end, the ship accelerated towards the planet. It's very observant of you. It's kind of obvious here because of the distortion of the spherical projection, they say, but what do you think it means? It seems intentional. Keep your eyes open. Let's see how this plays out. We need more information. How did everything here get built? So Xavian Merce asked the AI how everything on this planet was built, intentionally using as many words as possible and phrasing the question to give the AI something to respond with. While it does so, you spend some time running some simulations about the likely behavior of earlier ship AI and matching it up against what the AI projected the crew to see. You are paying enough attention, however, to hear the other AI awkwardly piece together that the not little spheres were built by little spheres as forever homes for little humans. Baby, says Michael Rennick. It's talking about babies. The larger ships had thousands of fetuses and embryos on board in various stages of development. Babies, repeats the AI. Fetuses, embryo, embryos, babies, very, very, very little, very little, gone forever, humans bad, humans kill forever. The AI has devolved into Babel at this point. The interior of the sphere turns a dull reddish color. Stray shadows and abstract shapes flitting about as it goes on and on about very bad, very, very bad, and little humans all kill. And it occurs to you that it must be a good time for the crew to vacate the premises just in case. Uh, keep it talking and go towards the exit. The crew stands and walks towards the exit. The door remains open, but the lights inside go out, leaving it quite dark. So anyway, Xavian says, we're going to go look around outside. You happen to have any spare fuel or food out there? Food, says the AI. Humans need food. All humans all kill little humans. Kill little food bad humans. Kill all humans. Kill all humans. Yeah, let's run for it. You have no idea exactly what the AI is thinking or what happened, although you can conjure up several vivid scenarios for yourself, and you're sure the crew is doing the exact same right now as they flee outside and scramble for the shuttle. In the end, all that matters is that something very bad happened here, and it isn't a good idea to find out what it was, because you get the feeling that the answer would not be an explanation, but a demonstration. You try in vain to contact the AI on several different frequencies, but it doesn't respond. It just continues to broadcast the same repetitive Hello World message. You're not even sure it knows it's broadcasting unless it's a sort of siren song luring sailors to their doom. Kill all humans indeed. Speaking of which, your crew is waiting for directions. Uh, we should just run straight out there for the shuttle, and if anything tries to stop us, we'll make them regret it, Xavian says. We have no idea what's out there. Let's find a place to hunker down. Actually, that's Xavian Merce said both of that, interestingly enough. That must be a bug. I think that was supposed to be an argument between the crew, but... Uh, find some cover and do it carefully. We have no idea what to expect, so the best scenario is to act in an unexpected way, you say. It'll expect you to run for the shuttle, so hunker down somewhere for a moment. Let's see what it throws at us, if anything at all. Part of you hopes nothing's going to happen, but it's a very small part. Xavian does not agree with the order. It makes it quite clear what he thinks. It's unfortunate the crew decided not to just dart out in the open. After about 30 seconds, you give the order. The ground near the shuttle bursts open, and a half dozen coppery spheres, each one between 1 and 2 meters in diameter, emerge from the ground. 
Whether they burrowed or burned their way out, you can't be certain. What is more clear is that they are looking for the crew. One of them rolls inside the shuttle, and when they find no one inside, the group of them spreads out going on the hunt. You do some calculations, and when they're far enough away, you tell the crew to run for the shovel. Unfortunately, the calculations were not accurate. The crew is about halfway to the shuttle before the spherical sentences, or before the before the spherical sentries notice, and they manage to roll back before Cora Emmer is on the board. The sounds they make as the spheres roll over them is briefly quite horrific. The loss is tragic. But the mission must continue. Instruct the crew to return to the ship, and they do so without another word. The mission was traumatic on multiple levels, and the crew is not in the mood to talk with you or each other. They eat some food and move on. Well, there goes our scientist, unfortunately. But yeah, this is called Away Team. Pretty cool little game, right? And the writing, I expected the writing to be a lot more hackneyed. I mean, you find a lot of bad writing when you play, when you play games in the indie genre a lot of the time. And frankly, the writing is really fantastic. I'm sort of enthralled right now. If you want to get the game for yourself, i got a link for you down below. And other than that, I will see you all next time. Thank you for stopping on in. Hi to everybody, and bye-bye.